Uh, the, the very first time I, uh, I um, talked about Sam Houston in public, uh, I think Sam Haynes was there uh, back at a Texas State Historical Association uh, meeting in, uh, uh, in, the, in the 1990s. And uh, I've been privileged to, to hear Sam speak many times since then. Uh, we were listening to each other, as I recall. Um, and uh, I've been uh, most impressed by his work, and, and, have, and I'm very glad to see that he's moving into an area of, um, of, of history which I'm finding fascinating myself, and, that is, and, and which speaks to exactly the last point that Professor Brands raised, and that is this mythical Texas treaty that Tom DeLay talked about for 10 minutes the other night, a treaty which doesn't exist. Uh, uh, t -t Tom, if you're listening, show me the treaty. Um, uh, uh, Sam is getting into the, into the question of history and memory, uh, of popular memory, of collective memory of the way we imagine our past and what this past tells us about ourselves and about our relation to the rest of the world. Uh, Sam's uh, earlier work in uh, the Mexican fights of the Texas uh, Republic, the Somerville and Mier expeditions are really interesting pieces of work. He's expanded his horizon to James K. Polk and the era of expansion in another book. Uh, he's now looking at how America saw itself with relation to the British uh, in the early 19th century and what that said about American uh, nationalism. Of course, those of you who are familiar with the history of the Texas Republic knows that Texas uh, found itself at the juncture of British and American ambitions. Uh, in the last couple of years, we had Stuart Reed to tell us uh, something that Sam may or may not agree with, and that is that James Grant... Uh, famous of the Matamoros expedition, was an active uh, or maybe sleeping uh, sleeper agent for the British. Um, Sam is going to talk to us today about what was in the memories, not just the minds, but the memories, almost the unconscious memories of those Texans who found themselves resisting Mexico and fighting a revolution in 1835-36. Anyone who reads any of those documents, both the, the political documents and even the casual correspondence from that time, knows that the spirit of 76 was very much alive in the minds of the Texans. And whether or not we agree with them that what they were doing was, uh, was uh, equal to or similar to uh, what their forefathers had done, they certainly believed that uh, themselves. And it affected uh, what they did uh, as all of us are affected uh, by our thoughts, uh, imagination can g become reality uh, when you're dealing with historical characters. And I am very anxious to hear what Sam Haynes of the University of Texas at Arlington uh, is going to be telling us about what was in the minds and the memories of those Texas fighters of 1835-36. Sam? Thanks very much, Jim. Thank you very much. Thanks for uh, coming and braving the elements. It's great to be back at the University of Houston. Um, can I just do a dry run here to see if this works? It does. Great. All right. This is easy enough. So my talk is Heirs to a Revolution, Looking for the Spirit of 76 in the Anglo-Texan Struggle Against Mexico, 1835-1836. Now, I'm uh, a lot like Bill Brands, I think. I um, didn't initially see myself as a Texas historian, although that's what I was doing as a graduate student. I at least see myself as a historian of the early American Republic. You can't hear me? I have to get close. To... We're both so tall, Bill and I, but uh, we have to lean down like this? How's that? Really? Wow. Okay. All right. Um, just practice bad posture for the next uh, half hour or so. Um, yeah, so I, I really see myself as a historian of the uh, early American Republic, and in particular, a historian of, of Jacksonian America. Am I doing all right there? Is that okay? And um, I do teach Texas history at UT Arlington, and when I do, I spend a lot of time talking about Jacksonian America, uh, probably more than my students would like, I think, because to them, Texas history starts at the Sabine River. Uh, it, it doesn't for me, 
Um, I, I think we really need to inspect the, uh, the cultural and the intellectual baggage of the people who come here, uh, the Anglo-Texans I'm talking about. Um, they come as adults and they come with their identities uh, as Jacksonian Americans fully formed. And so, um, so I think we need to spend a lot of time doing that. Uh, Texas history at times can be um, a bit on the parochial side. Uh, we need to see it, um, a, as Bill said, I think at one point, as a sort of as a natural extension of this Anglo-American push westward. Uh, so um, I, I want to talk about the impact of the American Revolution and how it informs the memory of Jacksonian Americans. Now, um, I'm going to start. Let's see. Oh, no, I've already forgotten how it works. Oh, here we go. I'm going to start with the Fredonian Rebellion. Now, I know I'm speaking to um, a group that is well-versed in Texas history, so I'm not going to give you any background on the Fredonian Rebellion. Um, but very, very briefly, if anybody is uh, un doesn't recall the episode, uh, you have the Edward Edwards brothers who are given an impresario contract uh, in uh, the mid-1820s, and they come to East Texas, and when they start to uh, demand titles to, uh, or when they ask the, the residents who are already there to show them uh, titles to their land, then they uh, do what American uh, land speculators often did, and that was that they, they kicked them out. And when the Mexican government got wind of this, they um, rescinded their contract. And the next thing you know, uh, the Edwards brothers are leading a, a revolution. Uh, they have uh, announced the, uh, rather uh, with great you know, grandiosity, uh, the Republic of Fredonia. <coughs> And they even have a flag. One of the first things you did, of course, when you led a rebellion was to have a flag. And here it is. And um, here, uh, and I won't read it to you all. I, maybe, can you read this in the back? In the, in the cheap seats? No, you can't. OK. Um, I will then. I, you know, I, I might have left my glasses in my jacket. Uh, we knew you were Americans, the sons of those long departed patriots who, when their rights were invaded, nobly grasped their arms and planted the standard of liberty and independence in our native land? Did our fathers, who are now no more, hesitate when they were oppressed? No, their blood ran in willing torrents upon the altar of liberty. Shall their sons do less? Our fathers in their struggle for liberty contended against the giant of the world. We have to contend against a corrupt and imbecile government now tottering upon its own foundation. Now, now this was written in December. This was written in December of 1826, and that's significant. And it's significant because this didn't come out as well as I had hoped. I'm sorry. Uh, it was significant because the nation ha was celebrating its jubilee year, 1826. Now, I don't know if you know anything about um, July 4th, 1826. Actually, it's not just the day itself. It's not just the 50th anniversary. It is a defining moment in American culture. Um, it uh, is not just simply one single day. It starts um, um, many, well, it starts a year and a half earlier when the Marquis de Lafayette is invited to the United States by James Monroe, and he tours the eastern seaboard and the uh, crowds that see Lafayette are nothing short of enormous, in the hundreds of thousands, perhaps in the millions. Um, I, I must say, the Marquis de Lafayette was now, um, he'd been in his teens when he was Washington's aide de camp. Uh, he did not look like he did in this picture. He was quite infirm. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, everybody wanted to see him. Americans in 1826 want to connect with the spirit of 76, and they do so in all kinds of ways. There is a, <coughs> excuse me, there is a monument building mania uh, in the mid 1820s. Uh, Baltimore, for a while, is actually known as the city of monuments, and these are monuments that are erected in the 1820s to celebrate the nation's jubilee. The uh, Bunker Hill Monument, of course, is in Boston. Um, that monument uh, had been started again in the early 1820s uh, and commemorated by Daniel Webster in 1827. The um, nation's 50th anniversary had been on American minds for a long time before July 4th, 1826 rolled around. You're all familiar, I think, with uh, James Fenimore Cooper 
And when we uh, think about James Fenimore Cooper, we think of uh, the last of the Mohicans and the leather stocking tales, but we tend to forget that Cooper had been, um, had, had catapulted to national prominence. He's really the first American writer uh, based on his Revolutionary War tales. The first is The Spy. Uh, the next one was Lionel Lincoln. Uh, the third one was The Red Rover. Uh, he is known in the 1820s as a novelist of American revolutionary tales. There is an enormous appetite for this kind of literature in the mid-1820s. American politics, um, I'm sure Bill can speak to this as well, American politics in the 1820s uh, are, is, is really informed by this historical memory. Um, this is a picture, it was done many, many years later, of the young Andrew Jackson. Uh, the, the, the tagline is, the brave boy of the Waxhaws. Uh, and you may know what this story is, is from. Although the picture was done later, I, I've included it here. If you look at Jackson's campaign literature in 1824 and again in 1828, what you find is um, this story of Andrew Jackson standing his ground uh, in the 1770s against a British army officer who has, according to legend, uh, asked him to shine his boots. And Andrew Jackson says, you know, this is what you can do with your boots. And the uh, British officer uh, whacks him up the side of the face with his saber. Now, um, Andrew Jackson's uh, anglophobic bona fides are pretty strong, as you know. I mean, he was the uh, commander at the Battle of New Orleans. And he had <laughs> defied the British when he invaded Florida. Um, uh, a few years later. Uh, but what's really intriguing and what's interesting to me in the mid-1820s is that Americans are fascinated by this story. It really is part of this protean Jackson myth. And this is something which uh, um, is, is, is important because uh, in 1824, uh, he's running against uh, three other candidates. Uh, none of them can connect to the American Revolution the way he can. And if you look at the literature, one of the things, it's the Jackson campaign literature, the things that, one of the things that you find over and over and over again is that the last of the revolutionary generation is dying out. Uh, James Monroe was stepping down in 1824 and he was the, the last of the so-called Virginia dynasty. And none of the other candidates could claim to have participated in the American Revolution in any way, shape, or form. And Andrew Jackson could. So it's a major part of the literature in 24, and it's a major part of the literature in 28. Right, well, why do Americans care? I think that's the big issue. Why do they care? And, um, and, and this is, I think, the argument that most historians make of this period. Uh, this is, the Jacksonian period is really a transformational era. Uh, it's a revolution, it's a cultural revolution in, some, in, in, in many ways. I think what, what appeals to Jacksonian historians uh, is that the country is changing so fast, but in so many really subtle ways. And uh, one way uh, historians use to come to grips with these changes is the market revolution. Uh, the market revolution essentially, and very, very briefly, I don't have time to go into the details here, but the American economy is changing. It's tapping into a larger global economy. I'm sure you're all familiar with the democratization of American life during the Jacksonian period. But the democratization of life doesn't just involve politics. Democratization involves um, uh, every aspect of American life. And so what you see here by the 1820s and the 1830s is the, um, the democratization of the economy. Alexis de Tocqueville, I'm paraphrasing here, but Alexis de Tocqueville comes to the United States about this time, and he said, you know, I've seen greedy people before, but I've never seen a nation of greedy people. And this is something that all Europeans comment on, that every American seems to be out for the main chance, that every American is looking to get ahead, that every American is uh, it, um, in pursuit of his own ambitions. Europeans had never seen this before. Americans had never seen this before. Okay. Now, um, and so this does create 
a certain degree of, there, there, there's, there's, there's a lot of criticism of this new materialistic consumer-oriented culture. I have another image here of uh, office seekers at the New York Customs, at the New York Customs House uh, trying, to, trying to get jobs. Um, but I simply want to uh, say, um, using this by um, just uh, by way of showing, that in the 1820s and the 1830s, Americans were beginning to bemoan the fact that they were losing sight of the values, or at least they thought they were losing sight of the more ennobling values of the Sons of 76, that we were becoming a uh, materialistic, consumer-oriented culture, and that those good old days were fading fast. And the July 4th celebration had become, to many people, a drunken revel. And as one said, the uh, idle theme of boyish declamation. In other words, boys, young boys gave speeches about the, the, the sons of 76, but we had really lost touch with what it all meant. Okay? So in the 1820s, when the Edwards brothers come to Texas, they are shaped by this memory in some very, very real and profound ways. And so are Texans who, Anglo-Texans, I want to make clear, Anglo-Texans, so are Anglo-Texans when they come in the, uh, af after the uh, Fredonian Rebellion, in the late 20s, into the 30s. This is a, um, the Texas in, the, in, this early, in this early period, as, as we all know, I think, is a, um, uh, a period which is uh, an area which is unlike um, the uh, settled portions of the United States. It's an area where uh, ethnic lines tend to be somewhat diffuse. Uh, it's an area where identities, and Bill talked about this, uh, tend to shift back and forth. Um, and yet what we're going to see by the mid-30s is we're going to see those lines of identity snap taut. Um, and Bill also talked about how initially a lot of Anglo-Texans were sort of fence sitters. Uh, they weren't interested in leading a revolution. People uh, are, do tend to be apathetic if um, they are left to their own devices. And by the mid-1830s, that had changed. And one of the reasons why it had changed, I would argue, is because of a group of men that are loosely known as the war faction. Sometimes they're called the war hawks. Sometimes they're called the war party. The war party probably isn't very good because it's not really a party per se. It's just a group of men who tend to be sort of hotheads and rabble-rousers and so on, okay? Um, and historians have looked at the, at the war faction and they've tried to figure out what distinguishes these men from the more circumspect ones. Okay, the men like Stephen F. Austin, for example. And what they found is they tend to be young. They tend to be unattached. They tend to be from the Deep South. They tend to be um, men who are um, looking to gain some degree of renown. And these are men, the Warhawks, not surprisingly, if you go back and look at the literature, it's the Warhawks who appropriate the rhetoric of revolution. It's the Warhawks who are using this kind of language over and over and over again. The, the term Tory, uh, to denote uh, someone who is guilty of treason, is used by William uh, Wharton as early as 1832, and he keeps using it throughout the 30s. There is a tipping point perhaps, in the uh, revolution in uh, the summer of 1835. And it's in July uh, when Will Robert Williamson, I'm sorry, you probably can't read the, the, who these people are, uh, Robert Williamson, William H. Wharton, and Branch T. Archer. There's a tipping point in the summer of 1835, and it comes when Robert Williamson uh, delivers uh, what's called the, the Liberty or Death July 4th address. Um, although they had taken an oath of loyalty to the Mexican state, uh, Anglo-Americans in Texas all celebrate uh, July 4th. And again, in the, in the 1830s, this as is as important an event as it is to Americans who are celebrating their jubilee in the 1820s. Oh, I want to get to the Battle of Gonzales in just a second. Uh, let me say this. So there, there are lots of, of similarities 
between the um, American Revolution and the Texas Revolution. And I'm really not going to go into that. I'm really more interested in the, in the, in the collective memory of these two events. Um, but I'm sure uh, a lot of similarities have, have occurred to you, and, and historians have certainly talked about this sort of thing. Um, in both cases, taxation is an issue. Uh, in both cases, um, you have um, uh, fence sitters, people who are sort of reluctant to get involved. Uh, slave owners tended to sort of jump on the revolutionary bandwagon just at the last moment because they had the most to lose. Um, you have uh, uh, individuals who are very, very important in stirring up uh, popular discontent, Samuel Adams in Boston, William Barrett Travis in Anahuac, for example. Both revolutions are uh, um, revolutions for self-government initially, and they become uh, revolutions for independence only later. But um, what I'm interested in is something else, and that is the way in which this memory shapes the actions of people in 1835 and 1836. Now, I said that the war hawks, the war faction, whatever you choose to call them, appropriated the rhetoric of the American Revolution. But that's really not all that we're talking about here. They do appropriate the rhetoric of the revolution, but they also act upon it. Um, that's the interesting thing to me, that the rhetoric becomes a, uh, not just, this is not just simply the, the, the use of the language of liberation. They actually think they are reaching back and connecting to the Sons of 76 by doing what they're doing. And a great example of that is the Battle of Gonzales. Now, Battle of Gonzales shouldn't really be called a battle. In fact, it really shouldn't be called a skirmish. Uh, I guess you could call it a confrontation, perhaps. And there's really a, um, it, it's, it's not all that clear why there was a skirmish there in the first place. Uh, Gonzales had never really been a hotbed of uh, uh, insurrectionary sentiment. Um, the officer who had gone out to Gonzales to retrieve this cannon didn't really think he was going to be fired upon. And during the course of the cannon that he, was, he had been sent to retrieve was essentially worthless. Uh, it had been fired only once before, uh, and the colonists had never really bothered to put it back into working order until the Mexican uh, detachment of the Mexican army arrived on October 1st. Uh, and, and so why, why do they, why do they, why does this become the, the shot heard round uh, the bayou, as some people say, of uh, the Battle of Gonzales? <laughs> And, and I do think it is because it has such obvious echoes with the uh, episode at Lexington and Concord, which all Anglo-Americans knew. Um, it's not insignificant, by the way, that uh, a number of the war faction uh, members were all there at Gonzales uh, in early October. Um, and it becomes uh, especially interesting, I think, when you realize that a, an itinerant Methodist minister had arrived the night before. His name was William Smith, and uh, he gave the men a rousing speech. And so if you can't read it in the back, I'll read it for you now. The same blood that animated the hearts of our ancestors of 76 still flows warm in our veins. Having waited several days for the Mexican army to make an attack upon us, we have now determined to attack them. Let us go into battle with the words of the immortal Patrick Henry before the Virginia House of Burgesses, deeply impressed upon our hearts, liberty or death. Now, the term liberty or death, we associate with Patrick Henry, of course, and every school boy and girl uh, knows that that's the case. But in fact, uh, Americans had only been apprised of this in the 1820s. Uh, there was a biography of Patrick Henry by William Wirt, a famous American politician, and it, was, it became a bestseller in the 1820s. And so the liberty or death slogan was actually a fairly new one, okay? Uh, and liberty or death becomes the, uh, the slogan for the revolution. It is in, in, in dozens, if not scores, of letters. And if you're wondering uh, where victory or death came from uh, that Travis uses to sign off on his letter to the Al from the Alamo, the um, victory or death had been used by George Washington at, uh, Trent at uh, Trenton. Uh, this was a, um, a, a, a rallying cry in letters that he used. It actually is a Masonic 
slogan. It, it goes back earlier than Washington himself. But Washington really, what the Washington is a uh, an extraordinary figure in this uh, in this period. He comes up again and again and again. Uh, Americans uh, in the 20s and 30s really were sort of obsessed with this apotheosis of, of George Washington, as, as this as this picture makes clear. Um, in the uh, consultation, uh, the uh, in in November. Um, Branch T. Archer is presiding, and William H. Wharton is there, the war faction, and they propose a, um, a flag for the new, uh, for, for Texas, which hasn't declared its independence yet, of course. It's only November, 1835. Uh, but what they want, they want to remove the Mexican green uh, and substitute it with uh, blue, and they want a picture of George Washington in the middle. Uh, and uh, with a glowing nimbus behind his head and the inscription below, um, in his example there is safety. I hope, I think I, it just slipped my mind, but I, that's close. Okay. Um, all right, well these are, just, these are just some other examples. Uh, let us prove to the enemy that we are not unworthy descendants of Washington, that's Philip Dimmitt. Let us give evidence that we are the true descendants of the band of heroes who sustains an eight years war against tyranny and oppression and gave liberty to a new world. That's Branch T. Archer. Now, there really is in this literature, it comes out again and again and again, this need to compare themselves to the exploits of Washington and the exploits of other American figures at the time, the sons of 76. There really is this need for validation and I think it's very, very important. To, uh, this, this kind of rhetoric is important for a couple of reasons. Uh, it becomes impossible to be a fence sitter under these kinds of conditions, especially when you have members of the war faction who are hurling charges of, um, of, of, of Tory subversion at you. Okay? The other thing which is so important about this kind of rhetoric it, is that it really does lead to something which I want to make clear, I think, would have happened anyway, and that is the alienation of Tejanos. Tejano Federalists had been very much on, uh, on board in the mid-1830s, mid as we all know. By the fall of 1835, they're beginning to peel away, and this language of liberation is something that they can't really identify with. Um, they had read Jefferson, they had read Madison, many of them, and they identified with the um, American um, post-colonial experience, but uh, this language of liberation was something altogether different. It clearly didn't uh, mean them. Okay. Now, what about Stephen F. Austin? Bill said uh, a minute ago that uh, Stephen F. Austin had been slow to uh, embrace the revolutionary cause, and and he was. And uh, and yet, the uh, consultation asks him to go to the United States to raise money and men. Uh, for this revolutionary cause, and and you may know that they send with him uh, Will, William H. Wharton and Branch T. Archer, and uh, it's no surprise then that somewhere along the way, uh, Stephen F. Austin also begins to appropriate this language of liberation. In fact, this becomes he and he had used several causes to explain why the Texans had revolted. This becomes one of the central reasons now by the time he reaches the United States. So this is a speech from Lexington, Kentucky. He gave another speech in Independence Hall in Philadelphia along the same lines. Our cause is just and is the cause of light and liberty, the same holy cause for which our forefathers fought and bled. If it was not ingratitude in the people of the United States to resist the theory of oppression and separate from England, can it be ingratitude in the people of Texas to resist oppression and usurpation by separating from Mexico. So now Stephen F. Austin, uh, not a member of the war faction by any stretch of the imagination, but certainly somebody who was appropriating this rhetoric and who was using it to explain why Anglo-Texans were doing what they were doing. And so of course we have by, uh, by March 1836, the symmetry is complete, uh, a declaration of independence lifted from the United States Declaration of Independence, of course, as we all know, uh, signed in uh, Washington City. Um, and so Anglo-Texans are using this experience and acting, not just using the language, but acting upon it and explaining their actions 
uh, using this cultural background. Now, all right. This really shouldn't surprise us. Uh, and, and it shouldn't surprise us because, um, because we've seen it recently uh, in, our, in our own lives. Okay? So what I, what I want to do is switch gears just for a minute here and talk about some more recent events, which I think are a, um, an eerily similar analogy, offer an eerily similar analogy to the events that uh, we see in 1835, 1836. Now, uh, 1995, uh, was the uh, 50th anniversary of the uh, conclusion of World War II. And we saw then, uh, in the late 90s, in the aftermath of this anniversary, a slew of books, all of which were bestsellers. Well, I'm sure there were some that weren't. But uh, if you go back and you look at the New York Times bestseller list in the late 90s, it is amazing how many books are books about the, the greatest generation, to use Tom Brokaw's now uh, you know, familiar phrase, it has entered our national lexicon to describe the people, uh, the men and women who had fought, the American men and women who had fought in World War II. This was a generation that in many ways, uh, it was said, the current generation could not live up to. And throughout the late 90s, the uh, greatest generation was being endlessly compared to the, um, the narcissism and the self-indulgence of the baby boomers and the Gen Xers and so on. And as a member of the baby boom uh, generation, I sort of take exception to that, but uh, uh, maybe, it's, maybe, it has, maybe it's grounded in some uh, basis in fact. Uh, uh, Rokas, The Greatest Generation came out in 1998. Uh, Flags of Our Fathers, which was later turned into a movie, also came out that same year. Saving Private Ryan also came out uh, in 1998. This had become almost a cottage industry. Um, not only did Tom Brokaw uh, and um, Tom Hanks and others become uh, uh, really uh, just national spokesmen for revisiting the uh, accomplishments uh, of the greatest generation, again, to use Brokaw's phrase, um, but it, it made certain historians famous, uh, like Stephen Ambrose, uh, who wrote uh, Band of Brothers, uh, and which was uh, also turned into a miniseries. Uh, Pearl Harbor, it, was, it had become something of a cottage industry by the turn of the century. Uh, Pearl Harbor was released, um, I don't know if you've seen this, it's uh, not a particularly good film, I'm not recommending it, uh, Pearl Harbor was released in the summer of 2001. It was a the blockbuster, uh, was supposed to be, I don't think it met expectations, box office expectations, but it was supposed to be one of the blockbuster hits of the summer of 2001. A uh, Band of Brothers uh, came out in September of 2001. And so maybe you know where I'm going with this, that in September of 2001, when the country... Uh, met this terrible, terrible crisis, our first thought was to think of this in terms of this World War II experience. Were the baby boomers and the Gen Xers going to live up to the accomplishments of that greatest generation? Was there some way this national tragedy could help us reconnect with those values? Now, um, pol um, U.S. policymakers, in ways uh, that were identical to Texas revolutionaries, appropriate this language. Um, I didn't actually know this until I was doing some research on the subject, but uh, when George Bush gave his uh, joint his address to the um, both houses of Congress in the aftermath, the immediate aftermath of 9/11, this was on September 20th, as I recall. Um, that speech, which I'm quoting here, uh, is replete with Churchillian references. There was a speech that Churchill gave in 1941. Uh, this uh, was almost amounts to plagiarism on the part of his speechwriters. I don't know that anybody had actually noticed it at the time. 
uh, we will not tire, we will not falter, and we will not fail. And I must say, now that I know that that's the case, it does sound awfully Churchillian to me. <laughs> but um, this was language which, had, which immediately had resonance for Americans uh, in a, uh, a post-9-11 world, okay? And so uh, it, it's a very short step from this kind of language to uh, referring to Islamic jihadism as uh, Islamofascism, as referring to those people who refuse to stand up and to meet these challenges in a, uh, in a forthright manner as being guilty of appeasement, as referring to uh, enemies of the United States as, as an axis of evil. Uh, over and over and over again, American policymakers, American pundits, the American public at large was using this language and using this experience to define the way we thought and behaved in a post 9-11 world. Now, um, let me just say this. Uh, it seems sort of hard to make this case, I suppose, because after all, um, in both cases, we're talking about their their desire to connect with events that are 50 years old, okay? The American Revolution had happened 50 years, more than that, when the Texas Revolution breaks out. Same thing is true in a post-9-11 uh, America. But in a way, it's not the, uh, the, the fact that these memories had receded makes them all the more useful, makes them all the more versatile. And the reason it does is because we have, we have sort of stripped away uh, from those memories this, the, the complexities of it, the nuances of it. The people who did, it, well, without going into any detail, these have, become a, these have become very simplistic sort of reductive struggles between good and evil. Uh, these became, to, to use a term that Studs Terkel once used when referring to World War II, these, had become, these were good wars. We weren't interested in reconnecting with more recent military conflicts, like the War of 1812 or the Vietnam War. We were interested in reconnecting with these wars that had been enshrined in our cultural memory. Um, uh, I just lost my train of thought here. Um, in the case of the American Revolution and in the case of World War II, uh, these were wars not just between, uh, seen as, as wars betwe uh, between good and evil, but they had easily definable beginnings and ends. They were wars that had morally satisfying conclusions. Most wars, and in fact, aren't like that, as we know. But certainly the American Revolution was seen that way, and certainly World War II was seen that way. And so I just want to draw your attention to the similarities here and the importance of these memories. Um, and, and I would ask you to think about one more thing, and that is that as historians, uh, we, and we all do this as historians, we tend to think about cause and effect, action and reaction. And we sort of assume that the study of the past is a study of rational processes. And you know what? It's not. It just isn't. I mean, it is up to a point, but we cannot lose sight of the fact that as Americans, we have cultural baggage, intellectual baggage, and it informs the way we speak, it informs the way we behave. And so I think it's important for historians to understand that sometimes, maybe not all the time, but sometimes we need to start thinking about the, the opaque in human motivation, not just understanding the rational motivations, but that subconscious motivations that make us do what we do. Thank you very much. Since I don't know what to do with this thing, I'll either oh. give it back to Sam or I'm a Luddite when it comes to most of that technology. Uh, we have a couple of, uh, of minutes before, we, uh, before we're going to take a break, and I may get us out just a, a few minutes early so we can be, be back exactly on time. But I wanted to mention a couple of things. One is, and, and both Bill and Sam have talked about this, both Dr. Brands and Dr. Haynes have talked about the Texas Revolution as an extension of an American revolutionary tradition and American memory and an Anglo-American story. Uh, as Jeff just mentioned to you in introducing me, I was privileged to uh, just complete a biographical essay on Jose Antonio Navarro. Um, and it's the best damn biography of Navarro ever written. <laughs> 
uh, I didn't have a lot of competition. Uh, David, David McDonald has one coming out, but I haven't, I haven't seen it, and it's not going to be published at least for another year. Uh, and I expect his is going to be a good one, but there was only one published in the 20th century, and it's, uh, I'll be kind, it was not written by a historian. Uh, and there were a few early attempts in the, in the 19th century, uh, uh, limited very much by uh, all kinds of circumstances, but Nevado was the first native-born Texan historian. Uh, and now we have both in Spanish and in English uh, available today his Apuntes Históricos, uh, uh, which point out that there was a revolutionary tradition in Southwest Texas as well, uh, a revolutionary tradition that, uh, that Navarro uh, witnessed as a young man, about uh, probably around 18 years old in, in 1813, when he had to flee uh, the Spanish uh, royalists who ended up uh, not simply uh, uh, hanging a few people, but lining up and shooting 300 citizens, which is a pretty good percentage of the, of the population of San Antonio. And uh, Navarro and Tio Francisco had to flee to the United States before they came back. Francisco Ruiz, who along with Navarro in 1836 signed the Texas Declaration of Independence. Uh, so Navarro uh, spans five of the six flags over Texas. Uh, the only one he missed were those French, and a lot of us missed those. Uh, <laughs> but uh, Navarro points out very clearly that there's a, and, and as some other historians have mentioned, that there is a convergence of traditions that takes place uh, in Texas in 1835 and 36. Uh, and one of the most important of the uh, one of the most important of those convergences uh, is the convergence of a, of a Hispanic revolutionary tradition with the Anglo-American revolutionary tradition. You really can't understand Texas, uh, either the Republic or the Revolution, uh, without being both both a United States historian and a Mexican historian, and that's why it's so damn tough to understand the Texas Revolution and Republic and to write uh, about, them, uh, about them with the kind of completeness and, and, and comprehensiveness that is necessary in order to understand not only the individual motivations and the images that are in their minds of what, who they are and what they're doing but, uh, and, and how, the, 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 how it turns out. I did want to ask Sam one question, and we've got time uh, for just a couple before we take a break. Uh, and that is, um, he, and I thought he was going, uh, uh, going there with this, but then I didn't see Adams and Jefferson pop up, pop up on the screen. But in, in July four, on July 4th of 1826, something kind of miraculous happened, which tended to give the 4th of July something other than the, than the feeling of a, of a drunken brawl by the prodigal sons of the, of the revolution. And, and, and that is the simultaneous death on the 4th of July of 1826 of both Thomas Jefferson and John Adams. And those of you who have read the Adams uh, or, or seen the Adams uh, uh, biographical uh, uh, miniseries recently are, are, are very, well, very much aware of that. But I just wanted to ask Sam to speak for a minute on, on perhaps the, 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 the notion that there is something providential about American history that, that in the American mind that might come from that. And I don't know if Sam's mic is on. I'll ask our, uh, is there? Hello? Yes? Okay. Um, the providential was the word, oh, there we go. Providential was really the word that was going through my mind when, when Jim was talking. Um, Americans have always um, seen pro a divine providence, a guiding hand in their history. Uh, I'm not sure that makes us exceptional necessarily. I think there are lots of other peoples that see a, uh, a, um, uh, a guiding hand in their own destiny, but certainly we do. And uh, the, uh, the deaths, the simultaneous, almost simultaneous deaths of John Adams and Thomas Jefferson uh, seems to bear that out, uh, that uh, uh, this is a country which has been marked for a special destiny and just that the symmetry of it was just really quite remarkable. So uh, it certainly does uh, lend itself 
to those kinds of things. But to be perfectly honest, I mean, throughout the 1820s, as the depression, as the depression, as the uh, uh, jubilee uh, got closer and closer, Americans had been saying those kinds of things for uh, a, a long time already. This just simply was more proof of what they already believed. Are there any other uh, quick questions for Sam before we take a break? Yes, sir. Will? Yes. He used the uh, phrase uh, that Stephen F. Austin used, the blessings of reverence, the theory of oppression. Mm -hmm. I'm not familiar with the phrase. Does that have a coinage prior to Oh, um, very, very briefly, I can give you the citation. There was another reference to it, uh, but I didn't put it on the... Oh, the theory of oppression. Uh, where does Stephen F. Austin get the theory of oppression term? Uh, it hadn't been seen before. Uh, I hadn't seen him, uh, hadn't seen it used before, uh, except for another letter that he wrote. And I have that citation. I can give it to you. But, but it was on that trip to Washington. Any more? I can see people are eager to be, be let out early. Uh, so we will begin, as your program states, very promptly at 11.15. So please take a break, see the cannon, see the exhibits, shake hands with old friends, and be back at 11.15.